Hi, I'm Stephen Bauman, and this is the third video in which I'm going to be talking about Barg drawings, what they're all about, the various stages of them, and some of the insights and concepts that you can benefit from if you're going to study these lithograph plates. Two videos ago, I started answering a question from a Patreon subscriber of mine named Phil Bennett. He was asking, how much time should he spend studying Barg drawings? So now that we've gone through the beginning and intermediate phases of the Barg drawing program, I want to settle in and talk about the advanced projects. These are the drawings that students of mine at the Florence Academy would do just before they graduated into drawing from three-dimensional subjects like plaster casts. Up until this point, we've talked a lot about simplification, we've talked about shadow and light dichotomy, and unpacked phrases like shadow is atmosphere and light is form, which this didactic series of drawings is meant to express in their practical application. The next couple of plates that I'm going to discuss are where the Barg program tends to be turned on its head, which is to say, in the first set of drawings and the second set of drawings, the almost total unification of the shadow value was almost omnipresent. Here, where we begin to investigate the Belvedere torso, we're going to see shadows that are filled with light and filled with form. And I'm going to explain how they're still organized based on the same principles of simplification and classification of visual phenomena. So without further ado, let's get to the plates. So here we have what is kind of the rock star of the Barg drawing course, the Belvedere torso. The story about this sculpture in particular, and I'm sure that there is some correction that will be necessary because I've only heard these things kind of secondhand, but supposedly Michelangelo was on hand when this antique sculpture was unearthed and he was so impressed by the arrangement of forms that it led to inspiring him in a way to create his later kind of mannerist sculptures. I'm sure there's some nuance in there, like I said, that is a little bit missing, but suffice to say the Belvedere torso is renowned for the fact that certainly it inspired Michelangelo, that it is from the classical Greek era, and that as a sculpture it is the result of many different decades and probably centuries of close and intense study of the human form. So while to our eyes it's going to look a little bit unnatural, so looking at the abdominal muscles for instance, we're going to see a characterization of those forms in a way that maybe we're not used to seeing, and so it can look a little bit jarring. But suffice to say, if we kind of look quite deeply into the sculpture, there's really a lot to extract. There are, in fact, two views of the Belvedere torso that are available in the Barg drawing course. The other one we can see here is the back view, and you can see the characteristic legs sticking out here, and some of the broken or chipped forms so common to antique sculpture that has had to survive so long in less than optimal conditions. But let's go back for a moment to the front of the Belvedere torso. Since it is by far the more common of the two lithograph plates that is copied, certainly at the schools where I've taught. So let's return to a quite common theme. If we look at the shadow shapes here, it's quite apparent to us that we're dealing with the same kind of organization. Shadow is atmosphere and light is form. The values inside the shadow here are almost completely unified and we can see very well then the shape at the contour of the shadow. And we can use that to design and triangulate in between all the other shapes and values that are in the drawing. Now let's contrast that against the next set of shapes that I think are interesting. Let's look at the pectoral here on the left. What we're going to notice is a form shadow edge on the actual pectoral itself, indicating that of course the light is coming from the upper left hand side. But what we have is a very noticeable distinction in between the value of the cast shadow with a pectoral and the value of the form shadow with a pectoral, which is probably receiving its reflected light from down here on the thighs. So we have light kind of bouncing down here up into the bottom plane of the pectoral, and what's happening is actually similar to one of the situations I mentioned in the first video where we had the projecting form of the nose catching a different kind of ambient light than the front plane of the muzzle form. Here we have the overhanging plane of the pectoralis major, its abdominal section in particular, catching light from a different direction than what the plane of the upper edge of the form of the rib cage slash external obliques are doing. So if we looked kind of in cross section here, we'd see the pectoral coming down like this, the plane of the external obliques like this, so we'd have light coming into here and light coming into here at a different rate and so that is going to account for the divergence in those two values. But remember, that is very different from what we experienced in our first set of drawings where the shadows were almost completely unified. Now let's come down to the area that freaks everybody out. Here, we have seemingly almost an undifferentiated set of organizations between all of the different planes that are taking place in this leg, which is sort of amputated here just below the knee, and all of the planes of sort of cracks and sculpture and so on and, and base forms that are facing all different directions and catching a great deal of ambient light. It would seem on the surface as if this is organized or viewed while taking into account a totally different set of premises. But what's actually happening is he's trying to show you a little bit more in situ how these ideas can function. So let's look for that characteristic shadow edge that we find in the earlier plates. Here we can follow a consistent value across the thigh, down the knee, just to the right hand side of the kneecap, 
and eventually down across what would be tedialis anterior. So we have this shadow line that has several different values and also different edge qualities, right? So let's just take that back for a moment. And I want to point out really quick all these different edge qualities. We have one edge quality here, which is indicating a very sharp turning form. We have another edge quality here, indicating a very soft turning form. We have another edge quality here, which indicates a slightly softer turning form with maybe a slightly faceted edge that's going to give it a nice dark halftone value. And eventually all of those edges become a part of that same shadow edge that he's using to communicate the difference or divergence in between the light shape, shadow shape. Now everything that happens after that is really what is seemingly an aberration from his usual strategy. However, let's take the squint down test on this shape first before we make any assumptions. So looking at it writ large, this entire shape, when we kind of squint down, I want you to just take a look at it, squint your eyes down so you're almost looking through your eyelashes at this shape. And the question that I want to ask you is, does that shape bond together and differentiate itself from the values within the light shape or is it totally separated and lacking in a kind of contiguous edge? As I squint down and look at it, one of the things that I notice first really is this large plane of really high key value for a shadow, which seemingly breaks up that shape. However, when we compare it to a value shape like this one on the other thigh, what we notice is that here we actually don't have that contiguous shadow edge. We don't have shadow values that differentiate themselves through a concentrated boundary from the light shape. Here, we definitely do. Here, we actually don't. So by contrast, this is a shadow shape through here that actually holds together quite well, even though it's containing so many different planes facing vastly different directions. So just to review, we've got our shadow shape that's totally common to the Barg experience. Here, we've got a slightly divergent conceptual shadow, which is caused by planes facing divergent directions and receiving different levels of ambient light. And then here, we have the total explosion of planes facing different directions and receiving different levels of ambient light and therefore having vastly different values values, but still holding together as an entire shadow shape when you look at it from afar and squint your eyes down. And then here we have that fourth phase where we've totally moved away from this idea of shadow shape, light shape dichotomy. And what we're really doing is organizing structure and form using halftones, right? So let's do really quick a uh, kind of diagram to explain where halftones fit into this. So if I've got my conceptual sphere here, right? I have my light source coming in from the upper right hand side. I've got my shadow edge through here which sets up my shadow shape light shape dichotomy and I've very likely got a cast shadow coming off from that form onto the plane that it's resting on. If we understand that this shadow edge is where we differentiate in between the world of shadow and the world of light, what we then can understand is that anything that happens within the light shape here is actually a part of a half tone. It's not quite a shadow and it's certainly not a highlight. so. It is a halftone. And those halftone values are what we use to create form within the light shape and create structure within the light shape as well. They are probably the more elaborate version of what value expression is. And I think students a lot of times have a lot of difficulty manipulating and understanding halftones and halftone values and, and how to use them well to create structure instead of just uh, you know rubbing them with a paper stump until they eventually blend together. What we really want to do is have concerted, soft, but specific plane shapes that are indicating very highly refined forms. So then when we look at an area in the drawing like this one, here we're using those halftones to the fullest extent of their capacity to create structure. We, we have totally lost the sense of a shadow edge or a palpable visual shadow edge like we have here on the thigh. And we are just creating various levels of gradation that turn at variously different speeds. And with that in mind, let's turn to another area that really brings home this point. We have here this section where we have the external oblique and probably some of the serratus anterior kind of coming together and merging and interweaving in the way that they do along the edge of the rib cage and creating this series of incredibly soft and nebulous forms that are difficult to differentiate in even the easiest of lighting situations. But here they are really quite complicated and it's definitely a stumbling block when people are studying this particular bar because what they get lost in is trying to organize this in a way that incorporates that strong shadow shape light shape dichotomy. They're giving edges like this to shapes that really don't warrant that edge. And this is something that I think is difficult to understand because it doesn't allow you to have kind of binary thinking. Usually we'd like to think that the world can be organized in terms of white and black. It's either one or the other. But in drawing, of course, and painting, as most of you know, if you've practiced it a bit, it's a world of kind of gray areas. And so you have to be flexible, you have to be agile with your thinking. And that's what this Barg essentially is telling you. You think the world is one way because you studied a previous series of Bargs and you learned a few concepts from them. 
But what happens when we throw you ultimately a lot of curveballs, right? So those ideas that you thought worked one way are now being tested. And that's why, of course, this is one of the last bargs that you face in your progress through this course, specifically because it challenges your assumptions about the organizational structure of visual phenomenon and puts you into situations where you need to improvise and actually probably loosen up a little bit. The solution, by the way, to solving this area the right way is to make the distinction in between what it is to add a value to a drawing in a shape that is specific. I mentioned earlier a phrase that's very important for students to understand and assimilate, and it's called soft but specific. Usually when we associate a shape with being specific, we think about a kind of point in space. If we can narrow it down to one line or one point in a two-dimensional space, that means we've unlocked the accuracy of it. Of course, visual phenomenon does not work like this. No matter how many times I would draw a hard-edged box around a shape like this one, I would never actually achieve an accurate sense of that shape because quite literally that shape does not have a hard edge. So we need to get rid of, in a sense, that thinking and embrace this idea that we have soft but specific shapes that have the same sense of kind of parameters that those other shapes did, which is to say, what is the height versus the width of this shape? There are proportions, there are angle breaks, but they are represented with an edge quality that is much more appropriate to what they are back to the back, we can see that it puts students in a very similar situation where value shapes are not necessarily constrained to their hard-edged forms that we associate with learning the shadow shape, light shape, organizational structure. We have plenty of kind of soft nebulous shapes running through the back, which for all of you anatomy buffs out there, certainly there is a sensible logic behind this, but upon first reflection, it actually looks more abstract than anything else. Another thing that these barks challenge in you really is your capacity to organize the world into straight lines. I find that very often when students are studying the figure and we have these long kind of rounded sinuous curves along the contour of the body, these are the places where students are least likely to kind of bend reality to the needs that they have in that moment of the drawing, which is to say, even if you have a lot of curves along the edge, you're going to find a more accountable and useful breakdown of that curve by finding its constituent angle breaks. In this set of lines, we have control. In this set of lines, we have a little bit less of it. Now, I don't want to go too far and be dogmatic and say that we have to break everything down into line segments and angle breaks like this because there's a lot of amazing artists out there whose work doesn't necessarily give us the evidence of that. I will say, however, that if you're following this course of training and attempting to understand drawing as it was done in this manner, then the reality is this is a key and core concept that will help you grasp and understand how this artist achieved the level of refinement and taste that he did. So that, in very brief, is the BARG program, such as it was taught at the Florence Academy of Art, and really probably quite common to how it's understood and traveled through by students in contemporary ateliers. Or at the very least, this is a synopsis of that course. Thank you so much for watching this video and hopefully the previous two videos that I did on BARG drawing. If you appreciate the content on this channel, please remember to like and subscribe, or even share it on social media if you want to. And if you're interested in more in-depth tutorials about portrait painting and portrait drawing, you can check the Patreon link that I'm pretty sure is up in this corner somewhere here. Once again, I'm Stephen Bauman, and thank you so much for watching.